go to our Bibles this evening, go to 1 Samuel chapter 18 tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 18. Um, we're going to get into our lesson number three tonight. Did everybody get a handout this evening? Anybody not get one? Very good. 1 Samuel chapter 18. I was informed last week that I didn't put blanks in there for you to fill out. I'm sure some of you didn't mind that, not having to do your work tonight, had it handed it to you. So tonight, you got to fill in the blanks, okay? So make sure you get a pen handy. encourage you to write down some notes this evening and maybe some things the Lord speaks to your heart about and uh, something that maybe uh, just one thing that God lays in your heart and maybe jot it down in your paper there, give you a little space to add some notes, take away some notes. And uh, let's review just quickly here from uh, lesson number one. Does anybody remember what lesson one was? where we found David, first of all. Anybody remember? If you can look back in your notes, if you remember. Anybody? <laughs> Dare to answer God's call. David was a simple shepherd boy. He was serving, and uh, he answered the call to be the next king and or preparing to be the next king of Israel. And that's where we found him in the very first uh, lesson the last week. Uh, does anybody remember where that was last week? What the notes or what the title was last week? F familiar passage, probably the most facing Goliath. Face, yep, yeah, facing the giant Goliath. That's right. David uh, answered the call to face Goliath. He he was willing. He was ready, and uh, he 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 dared to take on that giant, and God gave him the victory. But I think one of the most important truths we learned last week was that David kept his eyes on the Lord. He said, it's the Lord who fought my battles. It's not me. It's not the army. It's not anybody else. It's not my weapons. It's not anything I have, but it's the Lord. And that all Israel may know that there is a God. All the Philistines would know there's God. That was really the theme from last week's lesson. And uh, we're kind of moving along with this story. And we're going to probably come back to this same story later on. But tonight's lesson is dare to serve the king. And we're talking about being a servant of the Lord. And we're going to learn from some principles from the life of David, how he was a servant. And how he served the Lord faithfully, but he also served his king, those in authority of him. And uh, so let's go to our text here in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18 and get into this. I've, I've enjoyed these. I, I really do. I, I say that probably every week, but I really do enjoy these lessons. And uh, they're simple, they're easy to understand, and they really are applicable to us, uh, really in whatever stage of Christian life you are and you find yourself. But... Let's read our text here, 1 Samuel 18, starting in verse number 1. It says, And it came to pass, <clears throat> when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of David, or the soul of Jonathan, was knit with the soul <clears throat> excuse me, of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and wound or wood, I'm sorry, wood, let him go no more home to his father's house. Hey, there's a little echo up here, guys. I don't know if it's a floor, Steve, or something. We can turn that down. It's, it's, uh, it's starting to come echo here. <clears throat> Let's go back to verse number 2. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped him himself of the robe which was upon him and gave it to David and his garments even to the, uh, his sword and uh, to his bow and to his girdle. And David went out whithersoever Saul went or sent him and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight and ask his blessing upon uh, the time in his word tonight. Lord, we thank you for the word of God this evening. We thank you, Lord, for uh, all that you've done and all that you've uh, blessed us with. And Lord, we just thank you for this day. And we thank you for the time we could be in your word this evening. I pray that you help me to clear my mind from other thoughts and Lord, clear uh, out the things in our hearts and minds tonight that Lord, we can focus for a few moments on the word of God. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to uh, uh, take these truths and help them to uh, encourage us to be servants, Lord, uh, for your uh, honor and glory. And Lord, we ask all these things in your name we pray, amen. We find last week we mentioned David was now had conquered the great giant Goliath. He was uh, probably well known throughout all the, the country and people knew who David was because of him killing Goliath. But one of the most important parts, we shift gears tonight and go to the fact that now he's going to take a place of a servant. 
Now, David, we looked at, first of all, the very first week, he was a simple shepherd boy, boy doing the things that he was responsible for. He answered the call, the, the, uh, continuing the little things he had, being faithful and that which is least. And we found him last week as taking uh, the answer or answering the call to go and be a servant and, or, and go and kill the giant. Then he comes now uh, here in chapter 18 where he is now going to be serving Saul and really being uh, representing uh, Saul's household. And, and we're going to see this three principles tonight from the life of David, how he was a servant. But I would say this, first of all, God's word makes it clear that you and I as Christians are supposed to be servants. And I think all of us in the room tonight would agree to that, that we find examples out of the word of God of disciples serving the the people as servants following the Lord from place to place, Jesus himself. But then we find the greatest example of Jesus himself being the servant when he said in Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The Lord himself was the greatest example of a servant that we can find all throughout the scriptures. Yes, there's great men and women who serve God faithfully and they're great examples of the Lord and who served with all their might, with all their power. But there's no one like the Lord Jesus Christ, an example that he gives us as a servant. But we can learn truths from David's life as well too. And I'm going to give you three uh, areas or three ways tonight that principles we could say uh, that uh, can apply to our lives as they did in David's life. Notice, first of all, David was claimed by the king. He was claimed by the king. Saul took notice of this young shepherd boy as he had heard or watched as, as uh, David had conquered the Goliath, the giant, and uh, Saul then claimed him as part of his household. Look back to verse number 2. It says, And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. David now belonged to Saul's household, to his uh, kingdom there. He was part of his household, part of his family, if you can say that way. And David knew that he was supposed to be loyal to King Saul. He knew that his responsibilities now lied at King Saul's feet. He was to answer to him. He was to respond to him. He was to do what Saul had asked him to do. It's important for us to understand that we also, think about this, we also as Christians have been claimed by a king. We have been, uh, our stamp, uh, a God stamp has been put on us if we're saved tonight. We've been claimed by the King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, in your notes there, I've given you some scripture kind of to look through tonight, and you can go back to these texts because we won't take time to look to them. But 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, For as much as ye know that ye were redeemed, that word redeem means a bought back, with corruptible things as silver or gold from vain conversation received by tradition for, from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish, without spot. The Lord himself sent his son Jesus to die for us, and he claimed us as his own if we accepted him as our Savior. Then we go on to 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. It says this, it reminds us of this price that was paid and this fact that Jesus, we belong to him for his children. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says this, What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye have bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You ever heard somebody say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, I can do whatever I want now. Well, I have said to them, that answer may be true and partially, but here's the thing. If you're a child of God, you've been paid for by a high price. Giving of life, of, of giving of any life for that matter, is, is so important for us to understand that we owe everything to Jesus Christ. We, we owe him so much more than we really could give him. And the fact is that we can understand this thought tonight that we've been claimed by our king. But here's the fact that David was too. He was now part of, of Saul's home here and his, part of his, uh, his household. Once we were redeemed, we were to fulfill our purpose, which is to walk with the Lord and serve him. We're to serve him. There's a famous story, and you may have heard the story of a famous violinist who played to a large crowd. And after his performance, he bowed and started to walk off the stage. But as he did, the crowd gave him a standing ovation and yelled, Encore, encore. The man walked back to the center of stage, played an amazing piece. And after he was done, the crowd stood even more and cheered even louder and said, Encore again. Again, the violinist, uh, the violinist played and and returned to play to the audience, and finally he exited the stage. And backstage, 
the man was approached by reporters and asked him, why did you do so many performances? And his answer was this, the man who taught me to play was in the audience tonight. And when the crowd stood and cheered for the first time, he was the only one still sitting. And after the second time, he was still sitting. But when I finished playing that last song, my teacher finally rose to his feet and was satisfied. And I only wanted to please my teacher. Here's a question I, I give you before we get on to these next points is this. Christians and friends tonight, whom are you living to please? Who are you living for? What, if you could say anything in your life tonight that you live for anybody else, who would it be? Would it be for the Lord? Would it be for your family, friends? I hope the Lord is at the top of that list tonight. Is your life focused on Him, serving your Master, serving your Lord and King? We need to keep our eyes on Him. But look at these points tonight to think about David as claimed by the King. He was now part of Saul's household. He belonged to Saul in a sense. First of all, he was claimed for service. He was claimed for service. <clears throat> Saul chose David to serve along with him. He, he, he chose him. He, he brought him home with him and, and said, you're going to be part of, uh, of my household now, and I want you to uh, be here with me all the time. Now, obviously, we know that David had gone to Saul and played for him and had uh, tried to soothe him probably at some point in time. We know in the scriptures he had done that. And Saul now, now felt that it was important to have David's presence all the time. In other words, he knew that the hand of God, we're going to see in a little bit, that the hand of God was on David. And as believers, we understand that while it is true that not all are called to full-time Christian service, and we talked about this the very first week, we are called to be full-time Christians. Let me say that so you understand it. Not all of us in this room are called to serve God as in full-time capacity. I would consider myself a full-time pastor and pastor as well. My dad is a full-time pastor. We uh, this is our main livelihood. This is what we do with our life, and we, we consider ourselves full-time. Now, there are some men that are bivocational. They have a job, and they also pastor, and that's quite all right. Many people do that and need to do that, but that, that is what we're called to do. Not everybody in this room is called to be uh, full-time in ministry. You can teach and serve and other opportunities, but we are all called to be full-time Christians. As for our service here at church or for us as individuals, are we involved in serving Christ full-time? Now think about that. Are we involved full-time? If, if pastor or myself came to one of you and said, hey, I need you to do this. Can you help me out and do this? What would be your first response? We'll say, well, I, you know, I'm busy. I, you know, and look, we all understand we have all responsibilities, obligations, things we have to take care of. Family, we have to uh, meet their needs and take care of them. And I believe the importance of family is so important to take care of your family first. And, and uh, after you're a Christian, take care of your family. Then everything else can fall under that. That's just my personal conviction and belief in that. But we are all called to serve. And what would be your answer if somebody came to you and says, Hey, can you serve in this way? Can you do this thing? Can you take care of this thing for us? Can you serve in some way? Are you willing to be a full-time Christian for the cause of Christ. Because remember, you ultimately are not serving just the pastor or just this church, but you are serving the King of Kings. Colossians 3 and 23, or first, uh, Colossians 3, 23 and 24, saying, Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Look, our, our rewards are not on this earth. Our rewards are not here in this place. Our rewards are in heaven. And I ask you this question, what are you sowing now on this time on earth? This, this is a short journey we have on this earth. Are you sowing things that are of, of, earthly, of, of kingdom value, of heavenly value? Or are you sowing things that are of earthly value? Because those things will be passed away, as the, Matthew, the writer Matthew tells us. Second of all, we find that he was claimed for service, but second of all, he was claimed for separation. He was claimed for separation. Uh, down through history, people's names and uh, fortunes really related back to their name. If I was to say familiar folks, in my notes I have a number of people listed here, but the Rockefellers or the Kennedys, people who are now we would say Bill Gates or uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the people who established these uh, social media, they're, they're millionaires. They, they are famous, known for their status in this life. But in this passage, now we come to the fact that Saul has claimed David as his own, that now David is in a high place. Again, he's been put into a place that we're going to see here in a little bit, a place of leadership. But he, he's, now, he's now in the top place, I guess you could say, in a sense of the status of life and according to this 
uh, story here. But while the thing to think about this tonight is while we are still uh, children, our parents, we belong to our parents, or maybe, maybe your name is associated with somebody. Uh, maybe people would say your family name and they would know who your family is. And I came to church tonight, maybe many of you saw this, there was a funeral going on up here at the church and uh, there was people everywhere. And so somebody uh, knew somebody and it was a person that I guess was well known, but no doubt that person had a lot of friends and family. They were known for uh, who, whatever, maybe a particular reason. But you think about this, we are still... We belong to our parents, our family, we associate ourselves, but now if we are saved, we're part of God's family, and our stamp as Christians, are, we're a little, Christ, a little Christ-like is what we are, we're, we're to be Christ-like. You think about when a man joins an army, he is separated from his family, and here's the thing, when a man or a woman truly joins the Lord's army, it requires a degree of separation from previous alliance. In other words, that the things we did before we were saved, those things should not be associated with us anymore. Now David has a responsibility. He has a, a big job, a big opportunity to fill and serve the Lord. 2 Corinthians 6, 6, 17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Hey, look, we need people, we need Christians who are different. I'm not saying you have to be above everybody else. I'm not saying that you have to be uh, some high and mighty. I'm saying that we need people in this country, in this world, right now, in this city, the Christians that are different. That somebody notices something different about your walk with the Lord. They, you're not just uh, another Christian who sits in the pew, who start, you know, comes to church. And doesn't, I'm talking about people who are different. I want that to be said about my life. When God bought us <clears throat> with his blood, he claimed us for separation to him and from the world. By separating ourselves from the world, we bring honor to his name. Look, it's not about you and me. It's not about making our names great. It's not about puffing ourselves up. But it's about making the name of Christ greater in our lives, my life, and your life, all of our lives. And so David now had a responsibility to be different, to separate himself. Now he's coming from the world and from his normal responsibilities. Now he has a high place in Saul's kingdom there, and now he's a big responsibility. So we see that he was claimed by the king. His stamp, the king's stamp was upon David. He now belonged to Saul's household, and he was going to have to serve him and be separate, be different, and represent the king well. Let's move on tonight. I could spend a lot more time on these, but we're going to move on here for time's sake. Number two, we find this. He was commissioned by the king. He was commissioned by the king. Look at verse 5. When you get that blank filled in there, look back to verse 5. We're going to read that again. We find he was commissioned by the king. <clears throat> verse 5 in chapter 18. It says, And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself Wisely, maybe underline that little phrase there. It's important to know. And Saul sent, set him over the men of the war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Saul sent David as a rep representative of himself. So when, when Saul couldn't go, he would send David. David would represent the king and uh, battles and, and, and probably daily things that the king was responsible for. Now David was uh, serving the king by being responsible Here's a great truth that we need to remember this, and, and this really got me thinking today as I was sitting in this, thinking at my desk this afternoon about this phrase and this thought of Matthew 28. We know Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20, uh, the Great Commission, we would call it, and, and serving the Lord. But the thing and the fact is that you and I are representatives of Christ. If you're saved tonight and you know the Lord is your Savior, you and I are representatives of Him. That we're called to go out, not not necessarily as our brother back here has family that's serving the Lord in other parts of the world, and uh, maybe we know of people that serve the Lord in other parts of the world. Sure, they, they but we have a responsibility right here in our city to represent Christ. Matthew 28, let's read those verses there. You don't have to turn there, but just listen to these verses, familiar passage. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, <clears throat> All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. This is the greatest commission. We, we know these words. We know what this means for us is to go, win, baptize, and teach. But just as Saul's reputation depended on David filling his commission wisely, the reputation of our God depends on how we fulfill his commission. So I ask you this question. How are you doing with the Great Commission? Going and teaching and baptizing. That, that is what we're called to do as Christians. 
And we are to carry out the responsibility of our king, the commission that he's given to us to do. Notice two ways that David was commissioned by the king. First of all, he was commissioned as a servant. This is really the heart of the message or the lesson tonight is he was commissioned as a servant. The Bible states that David went out. This is commissioning entailed, or this commission uh, that Saul gave him entailed his leaving the comforts of the place and the capital. In other words, he wasn't going to be just sitting up in the, uh, the, the, the kingdom there, the, the place that Saul had, and he wasn't going to be just sitting there, uh, you know, eating and enjoying life. And I'm sure that there was times that he got to do that, but no, he was going out. He was, uh, Saul sent him to go and to represent uh, himself. As servants today, we need to answer God's commission by daily asking these questions. I encourage you to write these questions down. These are two questions that I, I encourage you to start your day off uh, each and every day. These two questions is this, Lord, where would you have me to go today? Where would you have me to go today? Where, where can I go? What can, and the second question would be, what would you have me to do today? Where can I go and what would you have me to do? I, I promise that if you ask the Lord those two questions, that I promise you, if you're walking with the Lord and close to Him and His presence, He's going to show you where to go and what to do. I, I, I say this, I'm 32, and the Lord has never misguided me or never directed me in a way. Now, I've gone, uh, the way we were talking in our Bible study on, on uh, Sunday night about this, our, some of the men and I, the pastor leads a Bible study on uh, Sunday night over Zoom, and we talk about the permissive will of God, and uh, what was the other one, permissive and perfect, perfect. that's right, I, my, my mind slipped me there, but permissive and perfect, we, we sometimes get out of the will of God by doing the things we want to do, and we try to uh, make things happen and strum up things, but listen, if we are walking with the Lord, He will give us and show us His perfect will for us. The Lord gave us a great example of Himself, as I mentioned a little while ago, Philippians 2, 5 through 8, another great Passes the book of Philippians, one of my favorite. We're actually going through Philippians with our uh, Sunday school class, well, our online Sunday school class, I guess you could say. We're going through the book of Philippians. It says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross." The Lord, when Jesus, when he came to this earth, he knew what his responsibility was. It wasn't to make a great name for himself, even though God received the glory for the things that he was allowed to do and the things he accomplished while on this earth. No, he knew that eventually he would go to the cross and give his life for you and I. Andrew Murray said this, this is a great quote. It says, God is ready to assume full responsibility for the life wholly yielded to him. Imagine that, the whole part of our being, every ounce of our being, everything uh, known, everything that we can think of is wholly yielded to the Lord. Man, imagine what God can do with that. Imagine the things, if we say, Lord, I'm, gonna, I'm tired of living this way, I'm tired of giving you half but not giving you whole, Lord, I'm tired of giving you most of my life, but that one little piece I'm not going to give you. Imagine if we gave everything we have to wholly giving ourselves to the Lord. Man, it would be incredible what God could do with each one of us if we simply serve him and be a servant and take upon the form of a servant. No, second of all, the way that King commissioned him was to be a servant, but also to be a leader, to be a leader. You know, leadership has a lot of responsibility with it. Uh, many times when we become leaders of something, maybe you are at a leader, leadership position, um, whether here at church or whether in your workplace, at home, if you're uh, the, the husband or the, the uh, father of your home, then you have a leadership responsibility or role there. But David began to really make a rep reputation for himself, that he was a courageous leader, that he was a responsible leader, that he took on this form of a leader, not servant first, but then a leader. But, you know, the Bible says here in verse 5, he behaved himself wisely. He behaved himself wisely. David went out as a representative of, of the, as a messenger, but also he was sent over the men of war. In other, other words, he was a leader of the armies. He was responsible for other men. David illustrates to us that those who are found faithful in small responsibilities will have an opportunity to be faithful in greater responsibilities. I think we talked about this on the first week uh, of answering the call, being that we're going to be faithful in that which is least. Luke 16.10 16, says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faith, faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. 
So we need to be responsible in the little things that we've been given. Maybe you say, Pastor King, I've been given a small responsibility. Hey, do that responsibility with all that you have. Serve Christ with every ounce that you can in that responsibility, whether I said this the very first week, whether it's taking up the offering, whether that's cleaning the church building, serving the nursery, helping with food, mowing the grass, God bless, mow the grass, uh, whether that's uh, fixing something, whether that's doing anything here for the Lord, be faithful to it. Serve the Lord. Enjoy the fact that you've been given responsibility. You know, oftentimes people want an opportunity to take on a bigger responsibility or take on a bigger role. But we need to be faithful in these areas that we've been given responsibility over. This could be areas such as uh, being, being faithful to church, greeting visitors, uh, giving, uh, having a teachable spirit. Our, we, we have to be faithful. And I'm talking about myself here. If I, if I can stop and say this, God really has, if I could use this term, raked me over the coals today with thinking about, and last night even, about this lesson, being faithful in that which is least, because more responsibility would come. Our leadership is often determined by our servitude. You think about that. How do, how do you serve in the places that you've been given now? How do you serve in the, the areas? I'm thankful for uh, the men who are running the sound and video stuff tonight. Uh, the guys that normally aren't here are, are weren't able to be here, and so the guys just stepped in and, and took care of that. I, that. That's just serving. Maybe you find an area that you need to serve, and you say, man, I need to do that. Take out the trash. I, uh, sweep the floor. Man, many of you in this room have served God faithfully for many years, and I thank the Lord for that. And we need to be servants of the Lord, as David was. He was a, uh, commissioned as a servant, commissioned as a leader. Notice the third thing tonight. We'll move on and finish with this. Not only was he claimed by the king, the king saw, put a stamp on him, said, David, you're mine, you belong to me. Not in a slave type of idea, but, uh, but as a servant. He was commissioned by the king to be served and to be a leader. David had a lot of responsibility on his plate. But then he was commended by the king. He was commended by the king. How many of you like to have compliments thrown your way? Anybody here like to be praised or complimented? Yeah. Some of y'all raise your hand, but I know everybody, uh, me included, like to have compliments, like to have things. We were at Kroger a few weeks ago. It's probably longer than a few weeks ago. You know, we were checking out our, our stuff, and, and this girl said, man, your shirt's really nice. And I'm like, this, I had like a, a polo or something. I, don't even, I didn't even think about it. I kind of looked down. I'm like, oh. You know, I kind of like, I like, you know, who doesn't like compliments, all right? Everybody enjoys that. But here's what happened. David what was commended for the things he was doing. People recognized David and, and what he was accomplishing. Uh, look, Matthew 25, 21 gives us really the, uh, really where our praise is found. When we do something for the Lord, whether that's telling somebody about the Lord Jesus himself, whether that's giving to the work of God, whether that's serving in capacity at church, whether that's being a, a leader, in our, whatever it is that God's given you to do, we know that our praise, our, our gl the glory that really is going to the place, is to God. It, it goes to Him. Matthew 25, 21, I'm paraphrasing this verse, but it, it, it says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. There's a song, there's a song that, that I've sung before, and it, it talks about, uh, well done, my child, you've been faithful, and you served me faithfully. And imagine standing at the, at, at the Lord and seeing him face to face, and he looks at you and says, well done, you've been faithful. That, that is a sobering thought, but it also is a wonderful thought to know that we've, if we're serving God with every ounce of every ability we have, that we'll be able to stand to him and look at us and say, well done, a good and faithful servant. Notice two things that David was commended for. We find, first of all, he was commended for his character. He was commended for his character. If you go to uh, chapter 18 on over to verse 14 and 15, let's read these verses here. You should be in uh, 1 Samuel 18. Uh, I should have said this. We're going to mainly stay, uh, we, we mainly stayed in this text tonight. And I encourage you to maybe mark those verses down. But look at verse 14 in chapter 18. It says, And David behaved himself wisely. We already heard that phrase. In all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw, that's, a, that's a kind of a hard phrase to say, when Saul saw, I don't know if that's, that's how it's written, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all, or, or let's go down to verse 30. I started reading on, but look down to verse 30. It says, And the princesses of the Philistines, or the princess of the Philistines, went forth, and it came to pass, after they went forth, that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much set by. Notice three things ab about David's character here uh, that's really interesting. We look at these verses. First of all, it showed that, he, that the Lord was with him. 
We noticed that last week as he was facing Goliath, the Lord was with David. The Lord was with him. The Lord, he was, you know, the thing about this, I was thinking about David's life. David had to spend time with the Lord. He probably, and we know we can read scripture, other references, take time to do that tonight. We're not going to take time to do that. But David spent a lot of time, I imagine, with the Lord. He, he had to get close to the Lord in order to know the confidence that he had. We talked about that even last week, about the presence of of the Lord brings confidence and gives us courage. But David, people knew that the Lord was with David. Second of all, it created a fear in the heart of an unspiritual king and others who didn't know the Lord. They said, man, the Lord was with that guy. He knows the Lord. He walks with the Lord. He talks like he knows the Lord personally. And then also, it was obvious to other people that David behaved himself more wisely than all, Saul's, all other Saul's servants. In other words, that they knew that this man, David, was... He, he was just a top-of-the-top -top servant of the Lord and servant of his king, that he represented his king well. Let me ask you this question. As we go about our daily business, or you go about your daily business, whether uh, in public or not, does our character, does your character say about you that you've behaved yourself wisely? I'm not talking about have you been, you know, not acting up. I know some people, you know, maybe the back row people aren't, you know, always acting like they're supposed to, and, you know, they may cut up, and I'm not talking about that behaving. I'm talking about spiritually speaking. Do, does our talk, talk of that as Christians, does our walk show that we walk with the Lord? Does our, our attitudes, our, our, everything about us show that we're walking, we're behaving ourselves wisely? Do we live according to the fear of God, which is the beginning of wisdom? Notice these verses, Psalm 111.10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Proverbs 19 talks about the fear of the Lord, the beginning of wisdom. Are those around us taking notice of our character? Um, you know, we, we can, well, I won't take time to get into this. I, I need to move on. Let me ask you this a question. Are we letting our light shine before men as Jesus commanded? Matthew 5, 16. A coach by the name of John Wooden. Uh, was a former UCLA coach. He said this, Be more concerned with your character than with your reputation. Bless you. Your character is what you really are while your reputation is merely what others think you are. Think about that. Your character <clears throat> is what you really are while your reputation is really what others think about you. What type of character do you have? What, what do you like when no one else is around you? What, 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 do, you, what do you think on? What do you act on? What do you look at? Your character is so important. It's hard to find people of character today. It's hard to really trust anybody. Honestly, it really is. And I thank God for the people in this room that are good people, that have good character, and are good representation of this church, and more importantly, the Lord. Let's move on. Second of all, he was commended by the people. So his character was commendable. That David, he knows the Lord. He walks with the Lord. He's a servant of the Lord. He, he's doing what he's supposed to do. He, he is, what, what he is out in front of people is what he is when no one else is around. As I mentioned, he had to spend time with the Lord. He, he had to spend time praying and talking to the Lord, and, and, and he spent time alone with the Lord. But then all, we noticed that he was also, he was commended by other people. Now we see David's career is not only does he have the blessing of God and the respect of the king, he also is commended by the people. When God's hand of blessing is evident in your life, in my life, it is common for people to hear of your reputation and to want to see it with their own eyes. You know, we could go out of the room tonight and name people that we know of that are good Christian people, that have Christian character, that may be preachers, maybe Christians, maybe uh, a family member, somebody you know. So, man, that person, they, they walk with God. And you know what happens? Other people want to see it, and other people want to know what you have. And maybe somebody around you at your workplace or uh, somebody in your neighborhood or somebody close to you says, they're watching what you do and what you say. I, I, man, I learn that every day being a dad of a little girl, she, she sees things and repeats things and tells things. And, uh, you know, she talks. Kyla has an incredible memory, and she can remember anything and everything. And so, you know what? It's happening. I have to make sure that I'm saying the right things and doing the right. Not, not so that I'm making sure that other people are, she won't run and tell. But, but you know what? People are watching. And people are watching you as your character for the Lord is, is on the line here in a sense. But David knew that he had a responsibility to serve the Lord and he had a responsibility to, to the people that were watching him, that he was supposed to represent King Saul well, but also his heavenly father 
well. Joshua 3.7, I'm going to read this last verse and we're going to be done. It says this, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all of Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. We're going to see the, David, the story of David unfold. And like I said, most of us know the story of David, but we're going to watch as God leads David along. I asked you the very first week, did David make mistakes? Yes. Did David sin? Yes. He was just like you and I. He wasn't perfect, but God's hand was upon the life of David. And we're going to see that as the story goes on. The need for servants is greater today than ever before. If we will uh, really, in a sense, copy or learn from the life of David by acknowledging God's claim on our lives, your life, accepting his commission, we can walk wisely and live with our king's uh, uh, commending us for our service. I asked you a question before tonight we finish with prayer, is who, who are you living for? Are you living for an audience of one, or are you living for an audience of many? Look, if we live for the audience of the most important one, then it won't, it won't be hard. It won't be hard to represent our king well, as just as David did.